From the 16th to the 19th century, an estimated 12.5 million Africans were taken from their homes and sent to North America, the Caribbean, and South America. This massive movement of people is recorded in the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. By 1790, 14 years after America declared its independence, there were about 700,000 enslaved individuals in the US. This meant that nearly one in every six people in the country was enslaved. Even though the Declaration of Independence stated that all men are created equal, this right wasn't given to enslaved Africans or African Americans. By 1860, right before the Civil War, the number of enslaved people had grown to nearly 4 million, 13% of the US population. Just five years later, slavery would be abolished with the 13th Amendment. Today, we have 12 photos from that time that show the harsh reality of slavery. These include images of the painful scars from whippings, the brutal devices used to prevent escapes, and the auction blocks where humans were sold like objects. These photos are disturbing reminders of a painful part of black history. But before we start, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more insightful videos on black history. Number 12. We start with a well-known photo that shows a man named Whipped Peter, who had run away from slavery. This picture was taken on April 2, 1863, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, while Peter was getting a medical checkup from the Union Army. The image was so powerful that it got the nickname, the Scourged Back, and was shared widely to show the cruelty of slavery. This picture is considered one of the earliest used for spreading a message or propaganda. In the photo, Peter showed his back, which was covered in deep cuts and scars from a severe beating by his previous owner, John Lyons, on a plantation in Louisiana. Peter escaped from his owner in Mississippi using a clever trick with onions to confuse tracking dogs. He made a tough journey to Baton Rouge, seeking safety with the Union Army. When Peter arrived among the soldiers, his clothes were torn and dirty from his 10-day escape. His story and image were featured in Harper's Weekly, a journal of civilization, a popular magazine at the time. The magazine included three detailed drawings of Peter, capturing the moment he was examined by doctors before joining the army, highlighting his scarred back from a beating he received the previous Christmas. Number 11. This next photograph captures Lucy Cottrell, a young woman who was born into slavery, as she holds the granddaughter of George Blatterman, a professor at the University of Virginia. Blatterman had acquired Lucy and her mother, Dolly, in the late 1820s from the grandson of Thomas Jefferson, a founding father and the third president of the United States. By 1850, following Blatterman's death, his widow relocated to Kentucky. It was there, in 1855, that she made the decision to grant freedom to Lucy and Dolly. This image is a strong reminder of the personal histories intertwined with the larger narrative of slavery in America. Number 10. A photo taken by McPherson and Oliver in 1861 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, captures two young, unnamed slaves who had just escaped. Their clothes are noticeably warm and tattered. The back of the photo has a caption saying, Contraband's just arrived. Contraband was a term used back then to describe escaped slaves or those who joined forces with the Union Army. In 1861, the Union Army decided that it would not send escaped slaves back to their previous owners. A year after, President Abraham Lincoln made a significant move with the Emancipation Proclamation. This executive order stated that the U.S. government, including its military and naval branches, would recognize and support the freedom of these individuals and would not interfere with their quest for liberty. The Emancipation Proclamation officially declared all slaves in the United States to be free. This meant that slaves in areas controlled by the Union were considered free from that point onward. However, slaves in areas still under Confederate control were legally free but in practice remained enslaved until the Union Army could liberate those regions. Any slave who managed to escape from Confederate-held territory and reach Union lines would be recognized as free immediately. Number 9. In August 1850, a significant moment was captured in Casanova, New York when over 2,000 people came together to speak out against the Fugitive Slave Law. This law was controversial because it required that escaped slaves found in free states be returned to their enslavers. 
The crowd, made up of people from different backgrounds, took a powerful stand by participating in a group photo, a daguerreotype, which is one of the earliest types of photographs. Among those in the photo were notable figures like Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave that became a leading voice for abolition, Jared Smith, a prominent abolitionist, and Mary and Emily Edmondson, sisters who had been enslaved and were free thanks to the efforts of abolitionists. This gathering was more than just a protest. It was a show of unity and a way to support William L. Chaplin, an activist who was arrested for helping slaves escape in Washington, D.C. The photo taken that day wasn't just a picture. It was a tool, a way to show the strength and diversity of the movement fighting against slavery. It helped spread the word and inspire more people to join the cause, showing how photography can be a powerful ally in fighting for change. Number 8 in 1864, a photo captured on Whitehall Street in Atlanta, Georgia, shows a building where slave auctions were held. The sign out front, Auction and Negro Sales, openly invited wealthy individuals to come and buy people for work on their farms. The building was right in the middle of a busy street, sandwiched between shops like a tobacconist and a cigar maker, making it seem just like any other store. Inside this place, African men, women and children were thoroughly examined by potential buyers, their physical attributes were assessed to set an initial price. The strongest and healthiest among them fetched the highest prices at these auctions, while the older, ill, or very young individuals were sold for much less. In 1793, Savannah, Georgia, was the setting for the first public demonstrations of the cotton gin, a machine invented by Eli Whitney. This device revolutionized the cotton industry by greatly increasing the amount of cotton that could be processed. As a result, the cotton gin played a major role in expanding slavery throughout the southern United States. By 1860, enslaved workers were producing over 2 billion pounds of cotton annually, accounting for two-thirds of global cotton output at that time. Georgia stood out as a leading cotton producer, alongside other key states like Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas, with Florida and Louisiana also making significant contributions to America's cotton industry before the Civil War. Number 7 A photograph from 1862 captures slaves working in the fields, planting yams on James Hopkinson's plantation on Edisto Island, South Carolina. The image was taken by Henry P. Moore, a photographer from New Hampshire who went to South Carolina to record scenes from the Civil War on April 8, 1862. At the beginning of the war, Union naval forces attacked the sea islands off South Carolina's coast. The plantation owners fled quickly, turning their field workers and house staff to come with them. However, most of the enslaved people chose to stay, knowing that if the Union Army took over the area, they would be granted their freedom. After the planters fled, the Union government appointed northern anti-slavery advocates to take charge of the abandoned lands and supervise the work of the freed slaves. These officials aimed to show that free labor was more effective and humane than slave labor, especially in cotton cultivation. However, many of the newly freed individuals preferred not to grow cotton or other cash crops. Instead, they chose to cultivate corn, potatoes, and other crops for their own use. Following the American Revolution, people in the northern United States, where slavery was less integral to the economy, began to see similarities between the enslavement of Africans and their own experiences of oppression under British rule. This realization fueled a growing movement against slavery, which gained momentum in the early 19th century. It wasn't until the 1860s, however, that slavery was officially abolished. Number 6 In the 1900s, American photographer Russell Lee captured a photograph showing Rich Bo Gelliard, who worked at the Federal Museum in Mobile, Alabama, demonstrating a bell rack. This device was originally used by a slave owner in Alabama to prevent slaves from escaping. The bell rack was a metal frame that locked around a slave's neck, designed so it couldn't be taken off easily. It typically had a bell attached at the top, which would ring loudly if the enslaved person tried to flee or move through dense areas, alerting others to their attempt to escape. Additionally, a belt was threaded through a loop at the bottom of the rack to secure the rod tightly around the person's waist. Slaves faced other harsh methods to stop them from running away, including iron masks, spiked colors, and shackles for arms and legs, some equipped with sharp spurs. Number 5 
Omar In Said, who was born in Senegal and is thought to have been photographed in the 1850s, stands out as one of the early Muslim slaves in America captured on camera. Before his capture, he spent over 25 years learning from renowned Muslim scholars, acquiring extensive knowledge. After being forcibly taken from West Africa to South Carolina in 1807, Omar, who was also known by names like Uncle Moreau, Uncle Marion, and Prince Amaro, was bought by a harsh South Carolina planter. Unable to endure the brutal treatment, Omar fled to North Carolina. There, he was caught and jailed as an escaped slave. While in jail, Omar's writings on the walls in Arabic drew attention. This led to his purchase by James Owen, a notable North Carolina politician from the South Carolina planter. Owen treated Omar with kindness, and the Owen family, recognizing his intellect, provided him with an English Quran and an Arabic Bible. Number 4 In April 1939, Russell Lee took a photograph of Willis Wynn, a former slave in Marshall, Texas, as part of the Federal Writers Project. The photo shows Willis holding a horn, which was used by plantation owners to signal the start of work for slaves each day. At the time, Willis claimed to be 116 years old. Born in Louisiana, Willis was enslaved by a man named Bob Wynn. According to Willis, Bob Wynn had always told him that his birthday was on March 10, 1822. When Lee met him, Willis was living by himself in a small log cabin located behind the Howard Vestal home on Powder Mill Road, just north of Marshall. Despite his advanced age, Willis was getting by on a modest old age pension of $11 per month. Number 3 During the Civil War, a significant interaction occurred between white soldiers from the North and many enslaved individuals who sought freedom by escaping to Union camps. This period was marked by a series of photographs that captured these encounters. In these images, black people, especially black men, were often shown in positions that suggested lower status, such as sitting in front of, kneeling below, or serving white soldiers. These photographs are crucial yet frequently missed pieces of Civil War history. They provide insight into how racial dynamics were visually represented during a time when the country was deeply divided over issues of race and slavery. The images played a role in reinforcing the idea of a racial hierarchy at a moment when the institution of slavery was being challenged and dismantled. The importance of these photos lies in their ability to illustrate how deeply ingrained notions of race and superiority were, even in the context of a war fought, in part, over the issue of slavery. Number 2 Georgia Flannoy, a former slave, was photographed in April 1937 when she was over 90 years old. Born on a plantation called El Moreland, located in Old Glenville, 17 miles north of Eufaula, Alabama, Georgia shared that she never knew her mother, who passed away during childbirth. In her youth, Georgia worked inside the plantation owner's residence, known as the Big House, serving as a nursemaid. Her duties confined her to the main house, and she was restricted from mingling with the other enslaved individuals on the plantation. The Big House refers to the main residence where the plantation owner lived, usually a large and prominently situated building on the property. Enslaved individuals working in the Big House were assigned various roles such as cooks, servers, butlers, maids, nursemaids, laundresses, seamstresses, and nannies. These slaves generally experienced less severe treatment compared to those laboring in the fields and often had access to improved food and living conditions. Despite these differences, house slaves were not exempt from harsh punishments. Additionally, there were instances where they were ordered to administer punishments to field slaves, acting under the directives of their owners. Number 1 In the spring of 1865, as the Civil War was coming to end, artist Alexander Gardner took a significant photograph in Richmond. This image captured 10 African Americans standing atop an embankment with the backdrop of a deteriorating flour mill. Despite the potential impact of this photograph, Gardner decided not to include it in his photographic sketchbook of the Civil War, published in Despite the potential impact of this photograph, Gardner decided not to include it in his photographic sketchbook of the Civil War, published in 1866. Instead, he chose another image from the same location that highlighted the ruined cityscape, titled View on Canal near Crenshaw's Mill. By making this choice, Gardner shifted the focus from the theme of emancipation and the lives of African Americans to the destruction and decline of the South. 
This decision reflects a broader tendency of the time to prioritize certain narratives over others. The photograph of the African Americans could have served as a powerful symbol of their newfound freedom and the end of the Civil War, but instead, Gardner's selection underscored the physical and economic devastation of the South. These photos are not just snapshots of the past, they are vivid reminders of the struggles and resilience of countless individuals whose stories are woven into the fabric of black history. Now we turn to you, our viewers. What are your thoughts on these poignant reminders of our history? How do these images shape your understanding of the past and its impact on our present? Share your reflections in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to continue exploring important chapters of our past together, helping us remember and honor the journeys of those who came before us. Your engagement helps keep these crucial conversations alive.